Well, good afternoon, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful to the Sudanese program for extending an invitation uh, to me to present at this uh, conference. And I have the unenviable task of following two very informative, excellent presentations. So we're already uh, running a bit late, and I'm, I beg your indulgence uh, a little bit uh, uh, more just to uh, really uh, share with you um, some of the, the background, um, the nature and background to the ongoing uh, persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, but also to explore some issues that arise from it. Um, you may or may not be aware that the Baha'i community in Iran has been the object of intense persecution since its emergence in the middle of the 19th century. And, and during that time, the Baha'is have been um, victims, targets of recurrent waves of executions, mob violence, uh, hostile propaganda, um, disappearances, uh, arbitrary arrests, detention, torture, um, denials of access to education, employment, um, all of these aimed at eliminating the community as a viable entity in, in Iran. Uh, since 1979, uh, there's been a renewed wave of persecution and violence that has attracted the attention of international organizations and governments, the media, um, academics and journalists, and progressive voices also within Iranian society, as well as prominent members of the Iranian diaspora, who have all noted uh, the innocence of the Baha'is and have urged the authorities there to uh, end the campaign of systematic oppression. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief or belief, Heiner Bielefeld, um, has called Iran's persecution of the Baha'is among, as among the most extreme manifestations of religious intolerance and persecution in the world today. Romeo Dallaire, the Canadian senator and head of the UN mission in Rwanda during the genocide there in 1994, uh, has warned that the gravity of the situation is, uh, amounts to a slow motion rehearsal uh, for genocide. And other scholars have, have labeled the persecution of Iran's Baha'is as an ideological genocide or a case of a suspended genocide. Now, although other minorities around the world have sadly been uh, similar, have subject to similar or even uh, worse, greater levels of persecution, uh, I think the manner in which the Baha'is in Iran have responded to this sustained campaign of genocidal intent focusing on a constructive and non-adversarial approach raises some questions that are worthy of further reflection. How, for example, uh, in the face of such a coordinated campaign to eliminate them, have they eschewed the mantle of victimhood? Faced with persecution of such ferocity and intent, how have they managed to prevent the seeds of resentment uh, and hatred uh, from taking root in their individual and collective consciousness? How, and more importantly, why, have they declined to utilize uh, the time-honored tool of responding to persecution through confrontation and adversarial opposition in both its non-violent civil disobedience guises and more violent manifestations? How and why have they avoided the allure of involvement in partisan politics as an approach to attempt to ameliorate their situation? So this presentation will, will try to explore how certain elements of their conception of religion has informed a particular understanding of the process and requirements of social change that has underpinned their response to persecution. And all those experiences may provide some insight into how religious minorities can strive to attain their integrity in the face of persecution. It may also contribute to the ongoing discussion about religion and its role in society at a time when the issue is, of course, of much focus and debate, uh, whether it be in the Middle East or elsewhere in the world. So the first part of this uh, presentation will review uh, the Baha'i community of Iran's experience of persecution to date. In the second part, um, the religious ideals and principles that inform their collective response to persecution in the wider context of their to approach to social change will be examined and the fruits of this response will be briefly discussed. So to the background. Well, for those who may or may not be aware, the Baha'i Faith was founded in Iran 
in the middle of the 19th century by Mirza Hussein Ali, who is known by the name Baha'u'llah. He taught there is only one God and that each of the world's great religious systems represents stages in the revelation of that unknowable divine source's will and purpose for humanity. The faith's social teachings include the full equality of women and men, the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, the elimination of prejudice, universal education, and the harmony of science and religion. The religion's most pivotal teachings, however, revolve around the promotion of unity and justice in the context of global independent, interdependence. The Baha'i faith today is one of the most diverse, globally distributed, democratically organized, and steady, steadily growing communities of people, religious or otherwise, on the planet today. It is estimated that Baha'is represent some 2,100 different ethnic, racial, and tribal groups and come from every religious background as well as non-religious backgrounds. The faith uh, has no ecclesiastical or clerical order. Rather, it is organized through a system of local, national, and international uh, elected uh, councils. And these are a means for uh, administering the, the needs of the Baha'i community, for channeling the energies of Baha'is in service uh, to the common good. And this, however, does not in any way imply that the Baha'is have a uh, political agenda. Um, they, are, they don't interfere in the affairs of government. In fact, they're required as an article of faith to refrain from involvement in partisan political activity and show loyalty and obedience to the laws of the land in which they live unless, of course, it violates their inner religious beliefs. So then, despite these peace-inducing and uh, teachings and commitments to promoting the common weal, uh, the Baha'is in Iran have been uh, violently opposed since uh, their, first, their faith came into being by the various religious and political authorities in that country and their followers or supporters. Some 20,000 early followers, including women and children, were killed in a campaign of barbaric violence uh, aimed at that time at the extermination of the community. Written accounts by European eyewitnesses of this period recorded followers being stoned to death, having their teeth torn out, their eyes gouged out, and being forced to eat amputated parts of their own bodies and having lighted candles inserted into their flesh while being led in chains through the streets. Now this persecution continued intermittently during the 20th century, coinciding most often with the need of various governments to shore up support from certain elements within the Islamic, uh, Iran's Islamic leadership. So the pattern was one of ongoing low-level harassment, social marginalization, and legal exclusion interspersed with some nasty pogroms in which numbers of Baha'is were killed in sporadic outbursts of violence. The establishment of the Pahlavi regime saw the recurrent persecution, uh, often at the hands of local and regional players, so to speak, increasingly initiated by central government. A policy of discrimination was formalized in the early 1930s against the Baha'is as a concession to the clergy. Baha'i schools were closed, Baha'i literature banned, Baha'i marriages criminalized, Baha'is in public service were demoted or fired, occasional mob violence resulted in murders and rapes, and some communal property destroyed or confiscated. However, with the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979, the attacks on the country's 300,000 strong Baha'i community reached a completely different level and that is official, that being official government policy. Whereas attacks in the past had been spasmodic and the government support for them had been based on political expediency, the clerics who came to power in the Iranian revolution wrought with them a deep and abiding hostility toward the Baha'is. The persecution was now state policy and the eradication of the Baha'i community an ideological goal of the government of Iran. Now, when the Republic's new constitution was drawn up in 1979, certain rights of the Christian, Jewish, and Zoroastrian minorities 
were specifically cited and protected. However, no mention was made of the rights of the Baha'i community, Iran's largest religious minority. And this exclusion has come to mean that Baha'is enjoy no rights of any sort and that they can be attacked and persecuted with impunity. Courts of the Islamic Republic have denied the Baha'is the right to seek justice, redress, or protection against killings, assaults, <coughs> or property theft by ruling that Iranians who commit such acts against Baha'is are not liable for their actions because Baha'is are classified as unprotected infidels, heretics, and those whose blood may be shed with impunity. In the immediate years following the revolution, some 200 Baha'is were executed or killed, including a significant portion, around 50% of the democratically elected leaders of the Baha'i community at the national and local levels, and hundreds more arrested. All Baha'i administrative bodies and activities were officially banned. Individual and communal property and assets were confiscated or destroyed. Baha'is barred from public sector jobs and business licenses regularly revoked or denied. Pensions and access to health care were denied. Um, Baha'i school children monitored, harassed, and at times expelled. Baha'is barred from higher access to higher education. So in short, members of the Baha'i community were stripped of virtually all the rights that are now recognized as the birthright of any, every human being and every citizen of the state. They had indeed become a people within a state, yet legally without a state in terms of state protection, while being a target of that state. The international community began to ex act systematically on the situation of the Baha'is in Iran in the mid-1980s and exerted increasing scrutiny of the Iranian government's actions through resolutions adopted at the United Nations General Assembly and other UN agencies. And similar resolutions were passed by parliaments around the world, appeals for justice articulated by an array of human rights organizations, and considerable attention devoted to their situation by the international media. By the early 1990s, international pressure had reached a consistency that forced the Iranian government to recalibrate its actions. However, Rather than cease its persecution, the government adapted its approach and its methods in, attempt, in attempts to conceal its actions. But the overall aim remained the same, the extinguishing of the Baha'i community of Iran as a viable entity. This consistent motive was clearly illustrated in a 1991 memorandum of the Supreme Revolutionary Cultural Council, a significant organ of the Iranian state. The memorandum which came to light in the 1993 report of the United Nations Special Representative on Iran, Reynaldo Galindo Pol, was prepared at the request of the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and the then President of Iran, Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani, to deal with what was ominously termed the Baha'i question. This document remains the current policy of the Iranian government. It has not been modified or rescinded. And it calls for Baha'is to be treated in such a way that their progress and development shall be blocked. Although making certain concessions, it is important to recall that the government of Iran <coughs> retains the wish to keep the Baha'is illiterate and uneducated living only at subsistence level and fearful at every moment that even the tiniest infraction will bring threats of imprisonment or worse. The memorandum states, for example, that all Baha'i should be expelled from universities, that they should be denied positions of influence, and that they are to be denied employment if they identify themselves as Baha'is. More worryingly, the memorandum, de memorandum declares that a plan must be devised to confront and destroy their cultural roots outside the country. That Iran would like to reach outside its borders and stamp out the Baha'i faith makes clear the degree of, degree of blind hatred felt, felt by the government towards Baha'is. So this policy then of attempting to slowly uh, but surely and quietly strangle the Baha'i community through economic, social, 
and cultural restrictions to avoid interna international censure continues to this day. Indeed, since 2005, there has been an intensification in the persecution with a renewed attempt to fully implement the intended aims of the 1991 memorandum. <coughs> this has been evidenced by a dramatic surge in the numbers and rates of arrests and imprisonments. For example, in 2004, there were four Baha'is imprisoned in Iran. In August 2010, 320 Baha'is had been arrested and 48 in prison. By June of this year, 2013, 677 Baha'is had been arrested and approximately 110 are currently in prison. More than 550 Baha'is who have been previously arrested and then released are either waiting trial or the call to begin serving out their sentences. Of particular note was the arrest and detention in 2008 of seven members of an informal ad hoc leadership group, uh, the Yaran, or the Friends in Iran. Each of these seven were sentenced to 20 years in prison in 2010 purely on the grounds of their faith. Economic restrictions have also been pursued with renewed rigor, with Baha'i-owned businesses subject to particular attacks. In some areas, such as Semnan and Hamadan, the vast majority, if not all, Baha'i-owned businesses have been sealed and closed down by the authorities. A wide-ranging media campaign, with the support of the state, has been instigated systematically inciting hatred against Baha'is by using false accusations, inflammatory terminology, and repugnant imagery, and of course having disturbing parallels with other state-sponsored anti-religious campaigns of the past. A particularly ominous development in recent years has been Iran's extraordinary effort to track down, identify, and monitor its Baha'i citizens. An example of this occurred in March 2006, with the public disclosure by the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief of an October 2005 letter from Iranian military headquarters instructing state intelligence services, police units, and the Revolutionary Guard to make a comprehensive and complete report of all activities of the Baha'is for the purpose of identifying all individuals of this misguided sect. There is evidence that this instruction has been and continues to be carried out. Now, the Iranian government has, at various times, denied any persecution of the Baha'is was happening, that the Baha'i faith is not a religion, but rather a deviant sect with seditious political intentions, that the Baha'is are spies for Israel or agents of American, British, or Russian imperialism, that the Baha'is were simply criminals spreading injustice, corruption, and immorality. The specious nature of these allegations has been clear to any fair-minded observer, but is also fatally undermined by the well-documented incidences of Baha'is being offered a reprieve from imprisonment or execution on the condition that they recanted their faith, underlining that Baha'is are persecuted solely because of their religious beliefs. It is an option that few Baha'is have taken. So although the accusations against the Baha'is may be dressed up in social and political terms, the oppression of this community is not related to any underlying issue of ethnicity, social class, or political ideology. So why are Iran's Baha'is persecuted so vigorously by their government, despite their commitment to non-violence, their steadfast non-involvement in partisan politics, their long-standing efforts to promote the betterment of their society? And the fact that the Baha'i faith is one of Iran's uh, non-Muslim minorities that bears witness to the station of Muhammad, regards, well, recognizes the authenticity of the Quran and upholds the divine origins of Islam. The reasons that some Shia clerics are bent on <coughs> extinguishing the Baha'i faith appear to be theological and material. Baha'is understand that this pattern of persecution is a manifestation of the misunderstanding and fear that often occurs when a new religion emerges from the, well, from the matrix of a well-established orthodoxy. To Iran's Shiite establishment, the emergence of a post-Islamic religion is not only theologically abhorrent, but threatens the system of patronage, endowments, political in influence, and social privileges to which they lay claim. 
Further, the progressive teachings of the faith, such as the equality of the sexes, the absence of religious clergy, and its impulse to work for the transformation of society are also seen as a threat to the established religious order's interests. This alignment, then, of theological interpretations and material interests has provided a powerful incentive for the persecution of the Baha'is for over 160 years. I would now like to turn to the question of the Baha'i response to this ongoing persecution um, and to describe briefly the vision and principles that guide this Baha'i, this response, which is located in the wider context of a distinctive approach to social change. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive treatment of the subject. It's, it's a best a cursory superficial review uh, of what is a, a fascinating social phenomenon. Now, I think this response to the persecution um, should be understood as stemming from a conception of religion as a source of principles and values which, together with science, propels the advancement of civilization. It is common to view religion as a welter of competing sects and denominations, each with its own personal beliefs, its set of personal beliefs, particular customs and prescribed practices. But this, it is submitted, is not a comprehensive view of the phenomenon of religion. It is also possible to understand religion as a continually evolving system of knowledge and practice representing the spiritual experience of the human race. Some of the truths it contains remain valid with the passage of time, but others speak to specific historical circumstances and require renewal and updating as civilization advances. In the Baha'i view, as the human race is a single species, so too the instrumentality by which God cultivates our minds and hearts is part of one unfolding process. Indeed, the founders of the world's religions can be seen as great reformers who awaken humankind to its capacities and responsibilities as part of a process that is not simply repetitive, but progressive. Too often, views about religion carry with them notions of division, strife, and repression, creating reluctance on the part of so many to turn to it as a source of knowledge, uh, in addition to belief, even among those who question the adequacy of entirely materialistic approaches. The Baha'i writings proclaim that all men have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization, and the, that the aim of every religion is to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind a transformation that will affect both its inner life and external conditions. So, informed by this vision, religion is understood as a transformative power which can unlock human potential for the betterment of society. The Baha'i understanding of religion as this single, evolving, civilizing process is, all, is rooted in a broader conception of the course and direction of history. Humanity, the Baha'i writings explain, is approaching today the crowning stage in a millennia-long process which has brought it from its collective at infancy to the threshold of maturity, a stage that will be marked by the oneness of humanity as the organizing principle of human affairs. And not unlike the individual who passes through the unsettled yet promising period of adolescence, during which latent powers and capacities come to light, Humanity as a whole is in the midst of an unprecedented transition. Behind so much of the turbulence of contemporary life are the fits and starts of a humanity struggling to come of age. Widely accepted practices, cherished attitudes and habits are one by one being rendered obsolete as the imperatives of maturity begin to assert themselves. This process of transition is expected to take, of course, many generations to unfold. Therefore, the Baha'i approach to social change, including its response to persecution and any forms of oppression, is pursued with this long-term perspective in mind and in a spirit of perseverance and patience. Baha'is also see in the revolutionary changes taking place in every sphere of life the interaction of two fundamental processes. One is destructive in nature, while the other is integrative but both carry to serve humanity, each in its own way, along the path towards its full maturity. 
the operation of the former is everywhere apparent. You don't need me to rehearse what they are. But although devastating in their effects, these very same forces of inter disintegration do tend to superweigh barriers that block humanity's progress, opening spaces for the process of integration to draw diverse groups together and disclose new opportunities for cooperation and collaboration. And Baha'is naturally strive to associate themselves and align themselves with the forces associated with integration in uh, attempting to construct viable alternatives, if you like, of social order and new patterns of social interaction. So then for Baha'is, unity is the primary goal of social evolution, but it's also the power through which these goals will be progressively realized. The principle of the oneness of humanity is, as mentioned, the pivotal principle of the Baha'i faith, and asks not merely for a sense of goodwill and understanding and cooperation among people and nations. It actually calls for the complete reconceptualization of the relationships that sustain society. It regards humanity as an organic whole, where the members of the human family are fundamentally inseparable and interdependent parts of a larger creation. And hence, relationship between and among individuals, institutions, and communities need to be recast in this light with all its implications. So this vision of unity is both the means and the, as, as the means and the ends of social change. It's so fundamental to Baha'i belief um, that it characterizes its work even in the face of violent oppression. Any, such, any approach to social change that seeks to pit one group against another, however subtly, can never create the appropriate or necessary conditions for spiritual transformation and lasting change. In addition to this collective commitment to the oneness of humanity, there are a number of other ideals and principles that are also relevant in this discussion. These include the recognition of spiritual and material dimensions of human reality, the cultivation of spiritual qualities and reliance on the power of personal example, the peaceful construction of viable alternative methods of coexistence and cooperation. The principle of active service to the welfare of others, regardless of their backgrounds or beliefs, even under oppressive conditions. So the upshot of all of this is that the Baha'is, in the case of Iran, instead of responding to persecution with violent opposition, non-violent civil disobedience or partisan political activity, are encouraged to be busied in whatever may be conducive to the betterment of the world and the education of its people, to neither succumb in resignation nor to take on the characteristics of the oppressor, that the victim of oppression can transcend oppression through an inner strength that shields a soul from bitterness and hatred and which sustains consistent principal action, and to respond to the inhumanity of their enemies with patience, calm, resignation, and contentment, choosing to meet deception with truthfulness and cruelty with goodwill to all. In short, the Baha'i response to persecution focuses on developing approaches, methods, and instruments that concentrate on revitalizing hearts, minds, and the behavior of people, including the oppressor, and on presenting a working model as evidence of the reality and practicality of the way of life they propound. The the High Committee of Iran, of course, can by no means claim, nor would it want to claim, to be a perfect embodiment of these ideals. Within any community, it is natural that the level of commitment to and internalization of norms, religious norms and teachings, and the successful application of them will vary among individuals. But its collective experience over many decades demonstrates a notable attempt of translating or at translating a particular conception of religion and its approach to social change into concrete action in response to the bitterest of persecution. For example, committed to the principle of the full equality of women and men, Baha'is founded the first school for girls in Iran open to people of all faiths and backgrounds. These schools were eventually shut down by the government during a particular episode of persecution in the 1930s. 
but they're never, nevertheless credited with training the first ever generation of professional women in Iran, leaving a lasting impact throughout Iranian society. Within the Baha'i community itself, Baha'i women in Iran under the age of 40 had achieved 100% literacy by 1974, compared to a national average of 15%. In the face of mass denial of employment, higher education and other rights of citizenship since 1979, Baha'is have attempted to establish creative systems to ensure their survival. For example, some Baha'i entrepreneurs, despite various antagonists to force them out of business, have been able to maintain modest businesses. Baha'is have also established informal systems to care for the elderly who have lost their pensions and to educate Baha'i children who had been expelled from schools. And in response to the denial of higher education imposed on their youth by the Iranian authorities, the Baha'is established their own open university in a process that was described by the New York Times as an elaborate act of self-preservation. Time is, is running out, so I'll conclude with a couple of brief, <laughs> with a couple of brief points, um, which hopefully will make sense of the foregoing. So by persevering with this principle and constructive approach, even in the face of systematic and sustained persecutions, the Baha'is in Iran are demonstrating the potential of a purely non-adversarial model of social change. Granted, the personal costs have been high for many Baha'is. And it is likely, however, that the cost would have been higher if the Baha'is had adopted a path for political resistance, opposition, and civil disobedience, <coughs> thereby alienating large segments of Iranian society by their own actions, providing the authorities with the pretext for a full-scale genocidal assault and confusing global perceptions about their innocence. Moreover, the emotional and psychological resilience of Baha'is who have experienced trauma in Iran has been particularly exceptional, as a number of recent studies have demonstrated. According to these studies, this resilience appears to be due, at least in part, to the strength and coherence of their inner beliefs, to the meaning, vision, and moral purpose their faith provides them, and to their ability to maintain an internal locus of control over their moral and spiritual fate. For the most part, the Baha'is Iran have never let their oppressors set the terms of their encounter. To conclude, the situation and future of religious minorities in the Middle East and elsewhere is often analyzed through the prism of international, relation, international legal norms and instruments, geopolitics, socioeconomics, history, historic and cultural issues, and a range of internal political dynamics in the states where minorities are persecuted. These are all important approaches and have their value in the ongoing discussion on religious minorities and issues of freedom of religion or belief. However, it may also be useful to consider the possibility that at its heart, these challenges involve conceptions of religion and its role in society. Societies in which religious minorities are persecuted often see religion as an element of identity that separates them from non-believers. They see religion as static, literal and dogmatic, religion as conferring privilege exclusive and final access to the truth, religion whose role, sadly, is seen as one of controlling and imposing its ideals on others. Now, although these, these are not clearly sufficient to create the conditions for persecution, they are arguably necessary. There is therefore some value in unpacking the underlying assumptions of such conceptions of religion, as well as reflecting on the ideals of religion and examples of lives lived by people of faith that can satisfy the long-held aspirations of most people to live in a cohesive, peaceful, and flourishing society. So at the very least, the experience of the Baha'i community of Iran of responding to persecution illustrates the power that conceptions of religion can have in motivating individuals and communities to constructively attempt to contribute to society, even among the bleakest of circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.